may I just remind everybody that there's a sign-in sheet. If yeah. you have not signed in, would you mind please signing in so that um, we can make sure we have all of the uh, all of the sort of dramatis personae here. Okay. Um, thank you, Lori. <laughs> this uh, this is basically sort of the overview of what we have in the slide deck. But when I'm thinking, can I just ask, are there any of you who haven't yet decided uh, how you're going to vote tomorrow? Alan, really? OK. Wow. OK. Um, but Alan, you were here last time, right? Last time. Um, the reason I'm asking this is in case you don't want to necessarily sit through the, um, the I don't know, sort of formal. The formal, thank you. You're welcome. Um, the scripted part, even though there's no script. But um, we'd rather kind of jump around and ask questions or look at things that interest you, um, focus on specifics. Um, does that sound okay to my colleagues? Yeah. Um, what do you think? It's fine with us. Great. Does anybody want to sort of lead off with with a question or an area of interest that you'd just like to hear about? I, I would appreciate, uh, just for my own uh, mind's sake, of, of refreshing the amendments and how they bear on the subject. Wow, this is going to be exactly in reverse order from last time. That's great. OK. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Laurie. You're welcome. But we don't have handouts. But we don't have handouts for the amendments, if, okay. if that's OK. But I think we can hit them um, one by one. Thanks. So um, of course, now, this is the most forbidding looking ballot that I've ever seen. <laughs> it's not. But um, the, it's actually pretty straightforward. When you look at article, first of all, the numbering of the articles. The big article one, as you've probably figured out, is the ballot article, the, the num it's numbering in the ballot. When it says underneath article four, closure of buildings, that fine print article four is what it is in the articles of agreement. So um, the ballot question is article, consists of articles one, two, three, four, five. I believe, right, Chris? Uh, yeah. Could five. we get something, Scott? Yeah. Just an overview of the fault articles and what these amendments are to. Oh, I, actually, you're the man to do that. So yeah. I, so you're standing up. <laughs> <laughs> so just, I, I mean, the amendments are to the state um, ordered uh, input into uh, effect these default articles of agreement that are basically governance documents. I, I kind of liken them to our constitution that will run the governance for the school district, the new school district. Um, and but also provide the opportunity for school for the district to amend them uh, through through a procedure like this one of presenting to the voters. So the amendments that are being voted upon are to certain articles in that default article package. I think it's article, there's um, 14 of these default articles. And what Scott was talking about is that where it says Article 4, that's the one in the default articles that's being proposed to be amended. Uh, and so um, the, these came about, these proposed amendments came about by an articles committee uh, that you know, worked through various uh, proposed amendments to the default articles uh, and then came to consensus on, I think, four of them uh, to present to the voters to determine whether the voters thought the default articles, which will go into effect on July 1st, if we don't do anything, to change those somewhat. So that's kind of the, the background of what we're amending. 
So Chris, yeah. so can, you, yeah. I, can you just back up one more step? <clears throat> because I want to make absolutely sure I, I, I understand this. I thought I did, but I'm not so sure anymore. So the voters will never get a chance to review the articles that have been given us, right? That is correct. Okay. Well, but not, not right now. I mean, the board can propose a new set of right. articles right. at some point but, in time. But in terms of if we didn't do anything, right. the default articles would take, would have, will go into effect in these let amendments. Me, let me back up. The voters of this district will never have the opportunity, as the voters, at an annual meeting, yep. an open annual meeting, to stand up from the floor and say, I want to amend Article 27. It's only the board that at this point can propose amendments that the voters can then vote up or down. The voters will have no say unless they come to meetings in the wording of amended articles. I think that is probably correct. I think it is correct. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's not like a school meeting. If, if I'm, you're saying like a school meeting that yeah, an open yeah. traditional school uh, right. school meeting where we don't have Australian balloting, we have floor votes. Yeah. And so this is really another consequence of what we gave up by not voluntarily merging. Is that right? If we had voluntarily merged, we we would have adopted our own articles. Um, we actually could have done it this year as well, um, but the timeline was so short. It was like after the, you have 90 days, you had 90 days after the um, state board order yeah. in which to propose articles um, and uh, adopt them. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, I, I think through the time, the timing was thrown off somewhat by getting the extensions that we did related to the lawsuit. Yeah. Um, and so that 90 day deadline, which was tight, um, passed. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's anything actually that would prohibit a school type meeting, um, kind of a constitutional convention of sorts, uh, to uh, deal with articles. I don't think there is anything that prohibits that. I guess, um, I, speaking for myself, I, I continue to stun myself at how we are being manipulated in ways that I didn't even understand until literally two weeks ago about the taxation system. I mean, I, I, I just didn't understand that until, until last week. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't understand about the articles until I started looking at this again and trying to figure out, well, when am I going to get a chance as a voter to suggest other amendments on a floor meeting? And, and now I'm realizing that's never going to happen. So I, I, I just feel like we've, as, as voters, we've really been shoved out into the cold when it comes right down to it. And we have to get used to having a much more representative <coughs> democracy in the way the school system is run. I mean, that's less. Well, the, 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 the full representative democracy as opposed to direct participation right. democracy. Oh, right. But the closest we're going to get to influencing decisions is attending school boards and suggesting things. We're never going to be able to stand up on the floor of a general five town unified union district meeting and say, I don't like Article 27. How about if we amend it to this? Well, that, unless, that, unless you folks would call such a meeting. We as voters can't call a meeting. Yeah. We, we can't call a general meeting of the right. unified union school. And, you know, but there's an opportunity for that during the organizational meeting, um, at least in part, to have a school-type meeting to vote on things like the budget, and, and that was voted down. It went to our Australian ballot, because you had the opportunity to say either well, we can do things by an Australian ballot, um, or the, and, and it didn't say or by school meeting, but the alternative, if you want to do it by school, um, Australian ballot was the school meeting, and we actually had, had a debate about that during the organizational meeting that finally occurred. And, and that was voted down pretty decisively, I thought, actually. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah. you. I'm, getting, I'm getting clearer here, but this, this is hard, and I, I just worry that a lot of people don't understand what's happening. I, I mean, it's really, it's a, at a very fundamental level, things, a lot of things are changing that I, think, I don't think we've all grasped. You know, just, uh, I think the you know, Worcester may be in a, a unique position because you maintain the school. We usually are. And, and everyone else <laughs> cannot uh, in terms of maintaining. They don't have to. Yeah, they don't so, but we, no offense intended, um, you know, Middlesex went. Because uh, then, 
you know, the prior clerk helped me with this research, and it was like 1998. I didn't realize it was that long ago, but uh, it, we went to a um, Australian oh, bound for the budget, because that, yeah. that's where things can happen. Yeah. So, anyway, yeah. good point, so. Yeah, so, um, so did that help? Yeah. 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 So, David, do you wonder why these specific articles are on the ballot? Uh, or I think I'm getting a clear picture that, that they, these amendments came from essentially the state. Well, actually, um, the default articles came from the state. Yes. The amendments are came, changing those default. are changing those default articles within the very narrow margins of maneuver that we're kind of permitted to work within. And and Chris, would you mind explaining why these particular articles, why these particular amendments? I mean, to the articles. Um, uh, well, 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 overall, um, I would say overall because um, I think it was the sense of the committee that they were very crucial, particularly the one about closing schools yes. yeah. and how that should happen. Um, and that was hotly contested. It was not, you know, it was not a uniform um, decision to go with this method um, because it, with the original article, uh, the default articles had is that no schools would be closed for two years. Um, after the after July 1, 2019. But then after that, um, a school could be closed by a majority vote of the entire electorate of the new district. And what this article does is it amends it so that um, you have to have a positive vote of the town in which the school is located and a majority vote of the entire district. So it is safeguarding the town's interest in maintaining its school. And that's, that was the goal here. Right. So effectively, if I understand correctly, the town has, the town in which the school being targeted for closing, say, has a veto power over that, um, over that decision to close. Is that fair? I agree. They have to vote positively to say, yeah, we want it to close too. Right. So the town says no. The town says no. It's closed. It's a great yeah. question. However, yes. along with that, you look at already, I mean, next year, the next session, they're looking at laws that will encourage funding. I mean, they'll prioritize funding for four districts that close schools, which means they'll probably withhold a lot of maintenance type dollars and things like that. So they're basically strong arming. And this is our legislature. And this is the Agency of Education. I mean, we need change, seriously, Pat. I mean, this is not what this state is about. No, no, no. This is a bottoms-up state, and they're responsible people in these communities, and they are being shoved out of the equation. This is what we call a dynamic situation, euphemistically. Yeah. yeah. Um, things are happening, you know, in, um, in different directions. So that first one, um, uh, I agree with Chris. That that's one of the key ones yes. on uh, on the voting regime for closing schools. Yes means veto power for the host town. No means just a, a combined five town vote. Mm -hmm. um, the the second article on the ballot is about this board, the representation on this board. Um, the question is, should there be three per town, or do we stick with the default two? And um, yes means go for three as of 2020, I guess, correct? Um, no means stick with the current two. Um, the third, article three, I have a well, question about, yes. I remember in the early discussions, uh, there, there was talk about um, allotting a certain weight to some of the the uh, board members. You know, a, a small like Worcester would get one third of a vote, two thirds. You know, it's kind of ridiculous. But that yeah. that is gone by the wayside. That's gone by the wayside. Yeah. So it's, so it's three <coughs> vote, or two or three votes. Three votes from Worcester, but the. Um, in the context of voters in all five towns will vote on all 
the, all, all the open positions for the board from whatever town. So Berlin voters will be voting on Worcester, um, Worcester designated slots. So that in a sense, the idea is that although they're coming from Worcester, they live in Worcester, they'll be representing this, you know, yeah. pentatown or whatever it is. Um, so you really don't have local representation, theoretically. I mean, it, essentially one or two towns could elect your officials represent from towns. It's theoretically, it's theoretically, space. theoretically yeah. possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. At the moment, I don't think it's happening just because nobody knows anybody at this point outside their own town. Um, that may change, you know, over time. But um, Article Three is basically about public participation. So um, encouraging the board to take early and strong steps to set up, for example, um, school advisory committees. Uh, and other mechanisms to allow for um, active public participation in the board's activities. Um, yes means, yeah, go for it, board. Make that a priority. No means, uh, don't care. Um, Hold on, before, before we go on, do we address sure. the word tentative? Yeah. There was some confusion about that at the last meeting. Right. Um, very good. I, I will defer to our. So tentative is it's not effective yet is what it means. Doesn't mean if you vote doesn't mean that if you vote for it it might not happen. Uh, it just means that it's not an article yet because you'll notice the numbering is 15 and then 16 and then 17, which add on to the previous 14 articles that are already part of the default articles. These, these are not amendments to articles. These are <coughs> proposed these are new articles. Right. Good. Um, July 1st is when they will go into effect, is that correct? It, it, yes, if it, it passes. passes. Yeah. And once these amendments are voted, they stand. The state does not have an opportunity to say, oh, I'm sorry, you've overstepped. They're, they're not subject to the Department of Education review for an up or down, uh, a thumbs up or a thumbs down. They're, they'll go into effect. Yeah. Basically, this is, this is sort of our playpen where we're allowed to do what we want. It's, um, there's a lot else where we're not allowed to do anything. Um, so, uh, number four is, is sort of a, a legal thing, the whole severability business, in case some part of the Articles of Agreement is uh, declared to be unconstitutional or illegal in some way, then that part can be sort of um, precision cut out of the whole articles without, you know, carving a gigantic crater in them by lifting an entire article um, out of those articles. Too many articles. <laughs> okay. Um, and number five is the uh, amendment that basically says that our doing this does not mean that we have waived our rights to continue um, pursuing legal action against forced merger uh, in the courts. So yes means, yeah, we want to maintain those rights to pursue action. No means, uh, no, don't want to, don't want to continue, don't want those rights. Scott or, or Chris, can you tell me the use of the term competent judicial authority? What exactly does that mean? Is, can it be anything other than a court? That's a great question. Well, it, 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 I'm it just wondering, be, is that... A hearing officer is a competent judicial authority um, in non-court. Uh, and so if there was something before the Board of Education that went through a hearing uh, before it, so that's why it's, it's broader than a court. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a legally acceptable way of constructing uh, an article like this? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, it's actually the phrase before, um, but it's more than, more than a court. That's why it's, it's, it's a broader definition than 
competent? Yeah, when I first looked at this, I was focusing on the word competent, thinking, what if it said incompetent? <laughs> and then I realized competent must not be the operative word or phrase. It's traditional authority. It's the operative <laughs> phrase. Yeah. Okay. Because that's broader than a court, is what you're saying. It, yeah. it is part of it. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And if I understand correctly, the, the, it, although that's the same thing that, that sort of ran through my mind as well, uh -huh. um, I think it refers to judicial authority with competence and sort of with jurisdiction. With jurisdiction, with jurisdiction more jurisdictional. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Good. So um, these are the amendments to the articles. Thank you. I, you're very welcome. We've mainly considered them as you know, slightly higher degree of protection Yes, um, definitely. Yeah, uh, so worth supporting. Rick? I just want to say, you know, I really put my hats off to all of you, Chris and Scott, Dot, everybody who really I didn't do much contributed to that whole process <clears throat> because these are the best protections we can kind of get. I mean, the hands were tied, but the, these are, I mean, it clearly shows that respect, you know, for kind of that bottoms up local represent you know local governance model, mm -hmm. and I know we're really limited in what can be done with this, but you've really done your best, and we appreciate it. I mean, I would vote yes for all these articles. You know, with what you we try music to our ears. Yeah. Right? I, mean, I hope well, others hear that. The radio. <laughs> <laughs> hear that. This question may may not be answerable at this particular time, and I, I don't want you or anyone else to get necessarily political here, but I've not a clue, not, this is my fault, my ignorance, I've not a clue how our own representatives feel about this whole process. You mean like Dave and Auburn? Yes, exactly. Um, I spoke to Auburn, and he's not thrilled about the way things have gone. I think that there's a lot of, I talked to Janet, she's not happy about the way things have gone. Um, I think there's a lot of, in the state house, I think a lot of, uh, there, there's a lot of anger at the agency for rigidity, right? For not being flexible with alternative governance structures, for not giving, you know, more time and allowing towns to delay more and more. Um, I've seen reporting in Digger that a number of representatives who sponsored the bill originally have changed their minds and now are not sure it's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's that's the sense that, that, that I've gotten. I'll also say that I've gotten the sense from uh, some of the people that I've talked to. You know, in the state house now, and used to be in the state house, that they just want this thing done, right, and to move on to the next step. And Rickers about to tear the legislature in the moment. Yes, <laughs> I'll control my rage. Honestly, I mean, we've been watching this for five years since the beginning, and we've been in those court in that legislature in those committee rooms. And there are a few people like Kim Jessup who have really fought it, Heidi Sherman, you know, Democrats and Republicans. But I mean, our Janet Ansel and Cummings, they've just let this happen. At the times when it was critical for their support, they weren't there. They say, they know their constituents are against it. Mm -hmm. But they, when it comes down to those critical points where it's a vote and a voice, right to the back row. You know, and that's, I, if there's something that engenders it, the least amount of respect to me, that's it. You know, you've got your core values that you're supposed to be reflecting, and you've got to have the spine to do it. You don't take your orders from your leadership to the point where they're damaging the public in our basic governance systems. And they have, believe me, people like Ann and the, any one of those, Jan, Ann or, or Janet or Ann, have, earned the, have the power to have really stop this, and they wouldn't do it. And we believe me, we were having those conversations with them all along. And you know, that's you know, that's a bad thing. And that's those are just the ones we've got here, but you know, they're and they're in the process of enabling more. You know, once this kind of gets established, they're just continuing to put the squeeze on. And the the irony it was actually clever the way this was set up because it allows them 
to disavow responsibility and basically put it on this group. You know, oh, that's their decision to close. But they, you know, this is, in my opinion, really insidious. And also what Scott was talking about, you know, the people that kind of turned and are now not, they're now saying they're against it after the fact. I mean, who is running that show? The Agency of Education works for the executive and works for the legislature. You can't tell me that they did not have the power to reel that in. If the AOE is asserting authority over them, then we've got to be, <laughs> there needs to be some serious decapitation done in our, in our, in our. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> I don't mean that. I'm talking about politics. I, 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 I understand completely. But how, how, say, how, this is the best of times, it was the worst of times. This is about, you know, about respecting and yeah. they're running the show. They're not elected of officials. And, you know, that has been very clear in this process that they have been running the show. Really, it wasn't the legislature that wrote this. It was Donna Russo Savage and the AOE, you know, and yes. the legislature and essentially, and that was an issue in the in the appeal, whether it was whether the legis legislature acted constitutionally by delegating essentially some of its legislative powers to the executive branch to come up with these um, default articles. But um, anyway, the board, of course, uh, that was, um, thank you, Rick. Sorry. Uh, I put that in the op-ed category, um, op-ed page. Uh, the board, of course, has no, um, has no political position. Um, we've barely met three times, <laughs> or whatever it's been. Um, but anyway, uh, again, the dynamic situation, I have no idea what the next session will bring, you know, beyond some of what you've been, um, what Rick alluded to earlier about the change in the, um, in the uh, support for construction and the possibility that that might be used in order to facilitate the closing of schools. Um, David, hello. Welcome. Um, so, uh, articles, uh, can I ask you, how many, do you think most people understand these we're going to be voting tomorrow? No? Yeah? Maybe not. Yeah. They don't have the context. The greater, the real, the, they, they won't have the context of all of the articles to understand how this is, I mean, you've only been given, given very narrow latitude to actually amend these things. And, and then you've done the best you could. But that's the context of, you know, the default articles. You know, we, you know, that's, you know, I don't think anybody can possibly really understand this. That's why I suggested, you know, having one-liners explaining, not saying yay or nay, but really, yeah. or not one-liners, but something very brief, right at the voting plate. Yeah. And God telling them what it means at the at the polling place. Yeah, yeah. We, we did we did issue a kind of a cheat sheet. Yeah. Um, that you know I don't know if they can take it on their phone or, or what, but um, hopefully it, it will help a little bit. But yeah, my concern is too because mm -hmm. it's sort of a <coughs> it's an imposing ballot to have to contend with. Yeah, most of the folks who I've from there, like, there's no idea. I don't really understand it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there seem to be I, a lot of people that are angry about it, too. Yeah. You know, just, yeah. But this gentleman's been talking about what I'm and what Alan, you know, there, there's been so much feedback around this state, you know, and we, we all see by example in Maine and these other states where this was done, it's failed, you know, for. For the smaller rural communities, not all. It works for the Chittenden County type, the bigger, wealthier communities. It's not. It hurts the smaller communities, and they're the most vulnerable. And you know, I, you know, to me, the fact they're not acting out of ignorance. They've had it laid out for them very clearly. You've laid it out. I've laid it out. 
hundreds of us have laid it down. You're talking about the legislature and the legislature. Yeah. And this whole process, and the AOE, you know, the process, yeah. they, they've taken that information and used it. Instead of to correct and improve this, they've used it almost against us to plug holes so that they, we didn't have ways to get around. I mean, to me, that is... You know, where is our democracy? You know, where is this equity everybody tells them? Do you look at this budget? I totally get it. Just you know, I know you do. But yeah, we, um, yeah, um, we're stuck we, with the. Yeah, our our situation on the board, um, we have to deal with these facts on the ground, basically, and maneuver in such a way that we serve our people. I get it. And um, support schools that that give our children the best education they can possibly get. Um, and the facts on the ground are not necessarily favorable to that effort at this point. Well, let's be very polite. <laughs> but I, I, yeah, I, I think you know, we have to approach it, uh, at least we on the board have to approach it with maximum degree of objectivity, um, even as we, you know, have our, our own personal opinions at the same time. David. Yeah, David Lawrence, Middlesex. Um, it does bring up kind of an interesting point, though, that because of just the anger about what's being done to us, like this might all, the articles, for example, might get voted down, not because people are actually objecting to the soundness of the article itself, but just as a protest against the entire process. Yeah, just say no as many times as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to as many things as possible. Well, you know, honestly, in the end, there's likely to be quite a backlash when people actually do figure out what's been done to them in a couple of years. And so, and if you've even got more stringent articles, that hurts us now. It's probably going to put more of a nail in the coffin on this thing when there starts to be a public revolt around it. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, I, I support these. I know what's gone into them, but I know, you know, the intent. I would never support the budget. That's, you know, because honestly, I, you know, it's... It's so unfair, and it's yeah. and it just reeks of inequity. But you remind me of it. The budget. Yeah. That's what this is supposed to be all about. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we can we can. Um, I think we're maybe with Scott Thompson right now. Say what you the budget. <laughs> 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 yeah. So. Thank you, Can Lori. you tell me the tax consequence for Worcester? Because the article in the paper that spelled it out <laughs> didn't tell Worcesters. Oh, sure. Would, would that be possible, Lori, to jump to the... Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And Lori is not only very adept at moving around within PowerPoint presentations, she also basically knows more than any single human being um, <laughs> about all of this stuff. So she's sitting there very demurely while, um, while I kind of do all this. But OK. This was from town meeting. Though. This is from town meeting. But this, you should use this as a baseline to understand with a comparison. So the combined impact on the residential tax rate from your, um, the budget that you voted for, uh, I guess you voted in April on the Doty budget? Yes. Yeah. Um, is minus 2.3 cents. So minus 0 0.023. Um, and if you could please wait. And the, um, the merge impact is plus 0 0.55, so that the difference would be plus 0 point, rather, plus point zero seven eight, which is, you know, roughly what would be predicted. Um, and this is, this is sort of the crux of the, um, the opposition that is uh, that there is to, to this budget, certainly in Palace, where there is a similar, you know, um, sort of jump. 
12 cent tax rate. About 12 cent, but, um, but minus seven. Four, yeah, yeah, so it's, it's really about eight or something. Mm -hmm. Is that right, Lord? Yes. Um, so it, it's in the same ballpark, yeah. basically. And uh, this is, you know, the result of the, you know, the kind of averaging everything out between higher spending towns and lower spending towns. The difference, much of the difference being accounted for by debt service. So, you know, it's just what's going on. Well, I mean, again, look at this. The, the proofs and the numbers, though, too. Your two poorest towns are paying the biggest increases. And yet they've got, if you go to the equalized spending per pupil, they've got the lowest spending per pupil in their schools. Now, you tell me in what world that that reflects any kind of equity for students. You know, I'm sorry, but I don't know. I'm fairly good with mathematics. And maybe according to the U32 math program, that adds up. But boy, in my book, it certainly does. Yeah. You know, this Fleur, is, this it's lower we're here. Um, let's imagine Laura sitting here. Um, she would say, well, if you subtract that portion of debt service, that debt service line, then the actual amount that um, East Montpelier is spending on educating its children is in the same vicinity. I've never, I haven't seen that. But the, you can't subtract I know, debt service. I, I know, the subtracting that something like that is, is, uh, is a bit of a, um, a kind of intellectual exercise that doesn't have a corresponding reality. So um, the reality is that that debt is there because of incompetence of management of that facility. And it had to be built. Mm -hmm. Callis and Worcester did not do this. They yeah. maintained their structures. And that, and you know, we're being penalized. I mean, that is a lot of money that, that for the next 17 years or whatever that debt service is. Yeah. I mean, that that is a huge burden on the, you know, on a, on poor people. You know, that's what, I mean, I, whenever I hear that word equity, I, I can't tell you how <laughs> that makes me want to do. I, I totally you know, understand again. Yeah, I mean, it's such it, a lot. It's, yeah, but again, facts on the ground. That's just, just, that's just a fact that yeah. we're that we're dealing with. And and but um, you're right, Rick. One of the one of the reasons why there's so much um, opposition is not just because it's a one year thing, but so effectively, it, you know, it's, it, it gets. Um, Sort of structuralized, if you want, baked into the structure of the of the finances. Well, you know, you look at on it. It's one hundred twenty-three dollars on a hundred thousand. You know, dollar property. That's a although remember, it would have been four a four cents increase <laughs> under the town budget. So, um, right, it's modulated comps or a little bit, but you know, I don't know. Right, I it was forty-two dollars. It would have been 42. But so. when you know you see the proportional drops in you know the the wealthiest town in East Montpelier, and you know and the towns are seeing drops because we're absorbing their debt. Mm -hmm. We we don't have debt for a reason. It's not because we just we deferred anything. We've been we capital fund. So it's, it's because yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the the capital plan yeah. and that's something that's. Something we talked about last time about uh, a priority of this board would be to get a, a, a tight grip on um, uh, big ticket capital spending so that we can you know, try to keep up with it. Big you know, plans. You know the, the, one of the most interesting figures to emerge from all this, and I'm, I'm still chewing on this one, not quite sure what it means. When you look at education spending per equalized pupil, that's on another chart that Laurie has, the average uh, spending of all the six schools, U32 and five elementaries, is 18,709. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And U32 is at 18,809. So it's just 100 bucks above the average. What's interesting is high schools, I, I think I mentioned this last time, high schools are supposed to be spending on average, 13% more than elementary schools. That's why we get a premium from the state. We get, the high school gets extra funds. 
So if my math is right, if you add 13% onto that 18,809, mm. you bump it up to 21,241, which is, that's, that's, that's higher than anybody. So the question, the question in my mind is, how have we been doing high school education on the cheap? for so long. Actually, um, Alan, I just want to clarify. Yeah. When um, the state increases the high school, they do it through increasing the pupils. I don't know if you remember okay. the phantom pupils. Yeah. And so it's already considered when you look at this amount. So you shouldn't do it a second time. It's already considered when I look at which amount. The 809. The, the pupils have been increased by the 13%. So it makes a cost for spending 18809 Had they not been increased, it would have been a higher number. So, the, so, so that, is that, so then, if to follow that through, it's using a phantom pupil to increase the number of pupils against which the total educational budget is being divided? True. By which, so True. that, what, what, so what would it be if you just used real life in school body students? I don't have that. Yeah, you can't do but that. But it's statewide, so I guess okay. the best way to compare you 32. Yeah. How many I guess it, one, one of the reasons I brought this up, and, and I still don't understand the math that Laurie gave. I mean, I do, but I don't. Um, there might be lessons to learn from what U32 has done for, what, 35 years. It might be educating kids more cheaply than any of the elementary schools is doing. And obviously providing a much greater array, array of courses. Um, and I, I, I don't know what that suggests. I mean, let's assume that U32 is operating pretty efficiently. Why, you know, when it's doing more? Does it mean we should maybe have one elementary school for the whole district? You know? are, are, are there really savings in numbers? I've never wanted to believe that, but maybe there really are. Because I think moving forward, we're either going to, we're going to try to equalize things. We're faced with three choices. One is to bring everybody up to the highest level of spending. The other is to bring everybody to an average, and those spending higher, you're going to have to figure out how to deal with it. Or the third option is to find efficiencies somewhere that allow us to keep spending, spending equitably on kids but doing it at a cost that is not as high as it currently is in some towns. I mean, I, I, I don't envy the jobs you folks are taking on. I mean, it, it's, just, it, 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 it's a real, nobody in this, in our five towns has ever had to deal with issues like this. Given these constraints, especially, oh, yeah. your hands are tied, your yeah. feet are tied, and I have concrete anchors put around your feet, and you're thrown overboard to expect to swim. Believe me, dealing with Act 60, to my mind, was easier than dealing with this stuff. Yeah. Um, because it, it, it was straightforward and it applied to everybody in the same way. And this, this isn't working that way. And you have the weights, you know, the weight of the high school kids or the family students kind of stuff. It's, this is hard stuff. Well, how many people, you know, I don't know, I've been an engineer, I've been <laughs> doing great advanced math for most of my life. And any time I see a system that is this complicated that no one understands, I'm questioning what's driving it. You know, I've seen very few things that can't pretty easily be digested. Usually if there's, things are made to be confusing because they intend for smoke and mirrors to be there. And I'm very distrustful of this type of calculus theory. And I don't even mean that in terms of mathematical calculus. But I have a hard time thinking that we can't have something that is much more transparent. I mean, I, it, you know, this is real. I think that's part of what's going on in this whole. I actually think this is about a consolidation of power and not at all about kids, not even at all about the cost of education. If they were interested in the cost of education, you know, every town in the state would be capital funded to begin with. You eliminate bonding and you, you eliminate a huge number of the spikes, as we've talked about. I've modeled that. You know, you can. That's where you can, you know, they're not taking those on. Those should be first steps. Mm -hmm. Instead of drastically going at the core of what's actually kept 
efficient, you know, cost constraints going? And you want to be working in this state? Um, part of the fun that we're going to have is trying to sort this out. Yeah. And Jonas was asking some of these questions about budget development. Um, and I mean, do you know, Lori? Do you have uh, already, have you thought through how you would like to see the budgets developed for next fiscal year? Well, I can go back to the chart that we have where we put the current processes. Okay. Will you, before you go on there, can okay. I make one suggestion? Sure. Moving forward. And this is, I suggest that the unified boards should start really talking to one another. And there, I mean, there, there are going to be some major breakdowns in this system because you're going to have to have a political force. You know, the Secretary of Education is spending 90% of his or her time sitting in that legislature lobbying against. We, you have, in singularity, you're not going to be able to, you're not going to be able to overcome, be able to apply the pressure necessary. I'm talking to other, other yeah, I think you should be, you know, just like we talked about with the Regional Planning Commission model, mm -hmm. you guys, we used to have the carousel meetings here. Maybe once a year or something, you guys, should be, or maybe more often than that, you know, talking about, at least on a regional level, maybe on a statewide level, wow. getting together and hammering through this. Because, I mean, we know what the outcomes are going to be. We've seen it in the other states, like Maine, and yeah, Chittenden County's going to do well, and Millbury do do well, but most of the towns in the state are not going to do well. Well, yeah, um, I think. So do you want me to kind of just read yeah, the process um, for us? Okay. Please do. And what currently happens is we issue contracts right now for next year. So what I typically do is once we have all the staffing online up, let's go to August, I usually roll up what would that cost this year and what inflation indices do we know about next year for health insurance, um, possible contract negotiations. Um, in addition to that, I take into consideration any um, contracts we have, like our bus company, um, auditors, any contracts that are going to go into the next year. So I roll up what I call a baseline budget, where there's absolutely no increases to staffing or changes, and it just basically kind of gives us a status quo model. And that seems to have worked with the board so they can say what would happen if we do nothing different. And then at that point, the board has in the past provided us with some recommendations. We would like to know what it might be to, to change something. It could go from a percentage across the board to um, program changes. And we roll up multiple scenarios at that time. And I actually start the process, as I said, in August. Um, the superintendent, myself, and the principals um, do this as a group. Um, but it's been, because it's been seven budgets, we do it separately with each principal and not as an entire group. Um, once we get the separate budgets compiled, then the entire group meets and talks about it. Um, the other thing um, that you may or may not be aware is the special education budget is a major uh, component. So in the fall, we need to report to the state a projected budget for the following year. And in doing so, um, Kelly Bushy works with the principals and myself um, and going through what is this current scenario in each school for students on IEPs, who's moved in, who's moved out. Um, so we consider that, and that information usually isn't here until October. So while we've already started the budget process, that's a huge piece of it. You cannot really update until then. Um, the concern at the time is that you're forecasting 18 months out with which students will be in our district or out of our district, and it's a highly volatile um, group. So having said that, you see all the scenarios. Um, what's similar is U32 used to have a finance committee. Um, and I'm wondering if this new board will end up with a budget committee or a finance committee. Um, in the elementary schools, they didn't really have a finance committee because it was such a small board they had. Um, the whole board would be the committee. So that would be the group of people who would review uh, the budget. There would be open meetings and public information, you know, type of common opportunities. Um, Usually between December and January is when the state gives us state information on financial components that impact the tax rate. So we don't really have the revenues until then. So even if you start in August, you're really just building a budget that you don't know what the 
if you can afford it, I guess is the best way to say it. Our tax is going to go up significantly with the change in the legislature. So that's what we learned. Um, by January, we also have what we call the common level of appraisal, which then impacts um, the tax rates as well. So it's usually between the first and second week of January that we in the past have had marathon meetings so the board can consider the entire budget rolled up with the tax impacts and, and make an informed decision on the budget that would be born. Um, did I go too far? No, that was great. Can I ask something else? You know, one, one of the things, and you did wonderful budget, is, I mean, I've never known anybody that did better budget. I think Tom Hellum said that too. And, you know, we die on the vine without you. Thank you. What will be important in those, as a reader and as a citizen, I've been on the board, you know, for, but as a citizen, you know, I think it's really important that we not allow those budget numbers to completely be disaggregated. I mean, to be aggregated. I think we need to keep it. We need to know what's going to the individual schools in real time. You know, we need to know how what resources are being allocated or not being allocated. And we will need, even though we're acting as a unit, I still think, you know, if, if we can't, if, if it's just a big, a single pot, you know, there will be no way to vet, you know, to get some sense of what kind of resource base, whether there's any equity or not. And I know that isn't, it's not money that defines equity, but it does in a way, it's a critical resource in that pot. And so, you know, are there plans to keep this uh, disaggregated? I listened sat in that Senate hearing room and listened to Nicole Mays and Donna Russo Savage say, with a direct question from one of the Senate Education Board members, they, they, I quote, he said, we all know this was all about the money. Now tell us what savings you've incurred, I mean, that you've, you're realizing with the consolidations that are, have already been done. And they froze like deer in the headlight. And they said, well, we don't have a way of telling you. And then they said, well, when can you? Well, we probably can never tell you. So the only way you can do this is separating those. You know, I want to see, you know, we need to maintain sufficient detail in these budgets. But I think especially at the beginning for confidence building purposes. Right. I think the beginning is a long time. Too. Yeah, right. and, and I guess we're going to sort of so it's not my decision. Out. I mean, yeah. I'm sitting here with a blank piece of paper saying, <clears throat> what is my role and what is my well, role? Well, I, I would direct you. you. This would be the board. I would ask. I don't direct you. I'm a constituent. Yeah, we're gonna, this is something that we'll demand. I tell you, I, I, if I don't, if that transparency is not there, it won't be a pretty picture. No, no, I, I, we I, can. There might be a way to ask it differently, Rick, and get an answer to your question. Gloria, are there any any reports you have to file or requirements you have to meet? You need to act, you need to know how much a specific school is spending for people. Would that be maybe for either um, uh, free and reduced lunch reasons, for uh, ESL reasons, for any other reasons like that, where the feds require you, for example, to have a per per people spending that from a specific school as opposed to whole district? Um, as I mentioned at the last meeting, the agency is right now trying to come up with a uniform chart of accounts, which will help differentiate and define what goes into each category. I have been told that, for example, I need to track electricity by building. I have been told I need to track fuel oil by building. I have been told I need to track instructional teachers by building. Um, but we don't have it all in writing at this time, and we don't have statewide a uniform um, system. Why would they so are you, are you, are you, are you, Well, what I'm saying is, is they, based on people who had merged before us, they had to ask these same questions. Um, down in um, Randolph, the business manager there was one of the first ones with a voluntary merger. So she said, well, why am I keeping track of seven electricity accounts, for instance? And she thought that it was going to be less bookkeeping yeah. associated with the merger and found out that, no, it was almost identical. So but one, of the, one of the things that at least two of our schools will continue to do every year is to apply for small schools grants. 
because we're non-voluntary merger, we have to apply rather than receive it automatically. And if I remember, there was what, a set of eight different criteria, I think, and one is efficiency. And certainly my understanding is to be able to answer the efficiency questions, you have to know exactly how many staff work in your building. Mm -hmm. And my question is whether you also have to know how much you're spending per pupil. Because once you start getting at staffing levels, you're kind of asking the same thing, really. So they do collect the information in some regard for staffing my building, but I have yet to see exactly in the future what collections would be the same or different. Uh -huh. It's all in getting the fine yeah. at this time uh -huh. stage, I think. The ones that emerged ahead of us, I have the budget submission is like, you know, I put in 10 different numbers, that's it. For the budget submission, it's all aggregated up. And it has been for years. It doesn't give it to me by building. So. And, what, and what happens to the small schools grants that get received by the schools that apply for them? Do they stay with those schools, or are they just mashed into the whole budget? They go into the general budget. Into the whole budget? But when you saw... I mean, but that, Alan, that was in Act 46 from right. the outset. Even the voluntary mergers, it just takes into the main... It's not, it's not, it's not dedicated. dedicated. Well, talk about a It's but, just not dedicated to the school. That, no, I know. I'm, I'm not supporting you guys. Believe me, that's just awful. But that was another reason why the cost per pupil was cheaper at Doty yep. and at Callis, because yep. that considered yep. those individual yep. towns having their own small schools grant. So you're right. The right-hand side, where it had the cost per pupil, has it all embedded in the entire total. So now what it's doing is those small schools grants are bringing down the cost per pupil for all, for all six schools. That's true. Some minimal, right? They were originally projected to be gone this year yeah, if we right. didn't merge. So originally it was intended to be a tax increase at each of the towns. And we had, had them. We had, was it two districts this year would have been subjected to the penalty because of excess spending, and now we have none because of the average? At the time, yes. Well, I, I don't. Um, Schools cut the budget. I mean, we cut, we, yeah. we uh, avoided the penalty zone. You mean, I don't think there was people who were in the penalty zone. Although I, I will say that one of the selling points during budget season was that, oh, if we were all together, it wouldn't yeah, be penalty yeah. zone. Right, right. right. But we, from a budgetary standpoint, we were not in penalty zone. You mean, in a different town budgets, nobody was in the zone of access right. spending? Not for the final budget, is my right. belief. They, okay. they, they cut at the last minute. Okay, right. Mm -hmm. It's great. Well, you know, I'm, I'm noticing the clock is hitting 7.30. And I wonder if maybe we should um, just do a quick recap by actually going through the slides. Okay. And um, <clears throat> before, before we do that, yeah, sure. Sure that, the third step there in the flow chart, finance committee, local school board review, and community comments. When we figure out how we're going to do this for you know, all six schools, that looks like a place where the local advisory committees would have a very, very important role in having meetings and doing it locally, having people who are involved with the schools every day, doing that locally, so it's not being driven by the top, it is the bottom-up process. I'm real. I disagree. For one thing, advisory committees have zero power. But it depends. I mean, that's not so six, seven years, years on the school board, right? And you know people don't come, they are just not educated on this budget process. I mean, you can't show up at a meeting and understand the complexity of these budgets. And then if they're not able to really dissect them, that was actually the point I was trying to make. But you know, we actually, I think, may have a cunning plan that I haven't had a chance to, um, to kind of talk to pitch to you, yeah. But I think um, I, I will, and, uh, and um, be interested in your reactions. But informationally, in terms of, right, in terms of getting boots on the ground from the local, each of the local school and the school, school communities, and in a way, that really kind of indicates that you do have to have budgets developed for each school. Um, you have to have the local input and say, this is what we think we need to run this school. They're probably felt um, by the principal, uh, I would think primarily. Uh, and so that is a informational point. You're right, it may not be a, a you know, the committee can vote, yes, this is our budget, and you need to respect it, but it will provide, um, I think, yeah. That was my point in asking Rory, you know, and you, we, you 
got to have the disaggregated data to be able for that group to work with any degree of, certainly on their community level. I mean, you, if you don't know what's coming into your school, sort of don't, yeah. how the heck can you review it? But I couldn't do that. Well, it's kind of, different. this is, you know, the way that I think could help is this is what we need to run our school. I know. As opposed to um, an overall, this is, this is what we're going to do for a district now, go figure out how it will work for your school. I think it's a ground up as opposed to a top down. No, I get the effort, but yeah. I also know the reality of, I mean, I used to build, you know, I, when I was at the college, I was executive director of facility operations. I did all the budgeting myself. I didn't have secretary, I didn't have anybody. And I had 13 buildings, you know, and I managed it very, very tightly and carefully. And, and you needed that data, you know, direct, you know, to be able to assess what everything was at, how it was performing. And, you know, and that's, we're not going, and I don't know, I've been in this world too, and I don't know how the hell I'd be able to, excuse my French, but how I could do that if I wasn't even, if I didn't have that disaggregated data. I mean, they talk about efficiency. You can't, I do this for the state of Vermont. 1,700 buildings, you can't animal assess efficiency of operation without disaggregating mm -hmm. data. You've got to have it very specific. And otherwise, you don't know what's performing well and what is not. And so I don't know how anybody can, well, even Lori, I mean, how can, she, how can she predict that if you can't separate costs? And, and I also think that it can be done pretty easily. Not, I mean, given, you know, I don't think it's all that big a deal to keep, even if you aggregate it, you know, to have those separated. I mean, I certainly did. I've written enough programs myself to do it. I don't buy software, I write my own. And, you know, that's maybe doing more. Who knows? <laughs> I'm just worried about, I, I'm just worried about the confidence of decision that if you don't have good data and information, you can't make good decisions. That's, and I'm worried that that's what we're going to take. I mean, we're going to do everything we can to, to get that good data. Um, I, I think uh, you're the only one left who hasn't been here before, who's not a repeat offender. <laughs> um, is there anything that you're interested in? If I, I were to run through the um, the sort of the, the main headline items of, on the budget, would that be of interest, or? Um, I think that it's actually been extremely helpful to... To hear all of this? Yes, to hear all of this. I yeah, for me as well. Yes, so yeah. um, um, if it would be helpful to the viewers on Orca, that would be great. Maybe they've, um, any viewers on Orca who have managed to sit through part one of this <laughs> and are interested in seeing how it how it turns out. <laughs> see um, if the sequel's any different. See if the sequel is, yeah, the reboot. No, no, um, I'll say that the, the, the <laughs> informational material has been presented by the, the board so far, just distributed in terms of the, I, if you really ask questions or the question and answer, um, that was really helpful. This is also helpful on a much higher level. Uh, rather like high level um, understanding of budgets. So in yeah, general, yeah, I think you guys have been amazingly transparent as far as you could be with this process. Yeah, this is the graduate seminar <laughs> on school budgeting right here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, voila. That's, the, that's sort of the, the top line of, of spending. Um, and this is this is the, the overall spending, correct, Lori? Sure. Okay. So this is not the amount that we're taxed on. That comes. Right. Okay. So here, the expense change is um, it's not that great. It's under two percent. But because our enrollment is going down, our equalized pupils are going down, so the overall increase is higher than, it is almost double the, um, you know, the net impact on taxes. So is that the, an average, okay. the, the 1.83? That's an average of the tax rates in the five different, in five different towns? Um, the one? I mean, how, how do you even get to that? It's confusing. Yeah. 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 
that's the, if you add up the total education spending that we submit to the state. Oh, I see what you did. Okay. It's comparing it to the prior year. Okay, I see what you did. So that's the, that's the penthouse level of the, of the tax formula. Um, then if you add the second floor, or the second floor down from the penthouse, the equalized pupils, that fraction is up 3.7%. Um, and, yeah, um, this is just a breakdown to refresh your memories. Let's keep going. Um, and this is, this is a really broad breakdown of um, direct hire salaries and benefits. And then um, the, uh, that little sliver, that little pie slice, of um, debt service and capital spending. Um, and then the non-salary, which is a lot of contract mm -hmm. stuff, right, Laurie? Let's say Washington Penn Mental Health or different programs for students on APs. Right. Or bus contract. Yeah, so one of the important things is that we're, we're supporting a lot of people. There are a lot of people who are, who are getting paid and who are then um, supporting stores, um, working, you know, the money is circulating locally. A lot of the money that gets paid to people circulates locally and supports the economy locally. Scott, I also wanted to, to ask Laurie, and I, I don't mean to belabor this, but that 54% given for staff and benefits, staff salaries and benefits, that's lower than most figures I've seen. It suggests schools that spend between 60 and 80% of their budgets on staff yeah. costs. Are we, uh, what, what do we do that has us so low? Is it, do you know? I don't know right off the top of my head. Um, yeah, but you thought about it. Yeah. So I mean, if you look at the 13 million that was contracts, a lot of that is service provision, which includes that's staffing right. and benefits that yes, just okay. are being paid through a contract as opposed to direct. Okay. So that's so, how we bring it. Okay. Right. The so bus that's, drivers. I, I would yeah. Think, yeah. So Dave Lawrence Middlesex, as, as a percentage, of course. It, it would go down as other sides go up. And so maybe the question is, how did we get that so low, but why are the other sides so high, right? It's, and I'm not saying they necessarily are, but it's, right. it, that is one possible interpretation. Yeah. I think it's an artifact of the classification that um, a lot of what other schools may have under direct hire, we're contracting for, and it's, under, it's considered non-salary because it's indirect hire. I guess just to finish, just one thing, that I'm finally realizing is having this kind of discussion makes me think about things that we should be thinking about moving forward when we see an anomaly in statistics. Yeah. Is it, what, what is this number telling us? It's so yeah. different. Yeah. And I, I think it's quite instructive, actually. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole business of asking questions is crucial. Yeah. Yeah. Can I have having the information? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. The administration costs seem high to me, too. And when I look not, I don't know about education, but I know business operation, and think that seems almost but, very high. But remember from last time, Rick, um, there, if I'm not mistaken, Ray, please, once again, correct me if I'm wrong, but there, there, there are a lot of classification issues here where some of what's counted in administration here, they're actually working with students. Um, they're, and, and I guess that's part of what they're doing is try to clarify okay. all of that. Why we're all using the same calculations. So what, I mean, I think so like that number is very Bill had told me that statewide 10% was the average. Statewide. For education, maybe it's certainly right. across sectors. I mean, I look at administration as administration and operation, right? And it really does, probably doesn't differ very much from area to area. And that's, these are very high compared to those. So now, if, if there are things that are related to teaching, they should not be in administration. That's, and are, is that being corrected? Again, this is that smoke and mirrors. If you don't know what you're looking at, how the heck can you make a responsible decision? Um, and you know, this is, yeah, um, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to get more and more clarity as we go along. The, the key thing about this chart, though, is the continuity 
that the two, the two pies are practically indistinguishable in the way they're sliced. Um, so there's nothing really dramatically changing. I think the next slide was what you wanted to see. Right? Yes, yes. And, um, and this shows in the major categories of the budget what the percent changes are from the present year to the um, to next school year. And you can see that most of them are within a range of between um, minus one and five percent, except for the capital fund transfer, which is dramatically lower. And that, I think, was, um, again, because of um, this is the minus 19 percent. Um, that was because of, as Laurie explained it to me, uh, the need for a couple of schools to get underneath that um, excess spending cap. So this, however, this is the sort of thing that uh, Alan is talking about, the kind of anomaly that might otherwise raise a flag. Because if, if we're suddenly not, not spending as much on, um, refer, on replenishing our capital fund, then maybe we're running the risk of having deferred uh, re replacements and you know, all the other things that go with that. Um, yeah, declining enrollment. We live in an era of population decline. For now. You know, for now. Well, for, for now. For here. For here, yeah. And that's that can rapidly change with when New England, but it turns out there's one of the only safe places to be. <laughs> that's probably going to be a rapid move northward. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> You're such an optimist, right? That's reality. <laughs> what time is that? <laughs> yeah. um, so this, we've looked at this with Alan before, this, uh, this chart. Um, yeah, and this is, the, this is basically the outline of the tax formula. Um, I think we should scoop over. And the common level of appraisal, everybody's favorite thing to not understand, certainly mine. And basically, the common, this chart shows that everybody's getting Everybody is having to pay more because of the common level of appraisal. Our houses are worth more than their, uh, according to the state, okay. yeah, than their, than their um, assessed at. Um, statewide tax rate, yet another gripping narrative here. Um, should we continue? Or any, any tax rate fans? Martin? Okay. Well, I mean, just okay. And then here again is the, uh, are the tax rate impacts from the town by town votes and then from the merge vote with uh, the merge budget with, you know, sort of the predicted um, variations. Um, income sensitivity, that's something that we didn't talk about. Um, is that something that interests you? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So this is, the, uh, this is sort of the, the nub of it. Um, incomes, there are basically three, I don't know, trials um, of income below 47,000, between 47,000 and 136.5 thousand, and then at the and then the subtotal is the third column of those two. Mm -hmm. Those are the two columns. Those are the two income segments that are income sensitized, and then the subtotal of those, and then the properties that pay full freight on the far right. So um, you basically see that. Calus and Worcester have the most, uh, the, the largest segment of population below 47,000. But by the same token, they're getting um, more income sensitization. And then in the middle, you know, they're roughly grouped together in the 40 percent, in the 40 percent. Um, so they're partially income sensitized. And then, <clears throat> You get the um, the people who, who pay uh, solely based on property on the far right. 
ranging from a low of 32 in Worcester to a high of 44 in Middlesex. So now this income sensitivity only counts, am I wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, but for the homestead in two acres, correct? So, I mean, then beyond that, that's not, that is not that's that's true. That's true. That's true. So, I mean, yeah, that, that can be very deceiving, especially for, mm -hmm. you know, if you've got somebody who's got, let's say, farms, there's practically no farms left, but some, you know, any kind of amount of land and things like that, these numbers are actually deceiving. I mean, there is no sensitivity on the rest of that asset sitting there. Yeah. So, yeah, unless you live on a, you know, complete postage stamp. So. Right. But, but this is a, a little bit of a, you know, break. sort of an, yeah, an Advil for the higher taxpayers in the, in the new arrangement. Mm -hmm. um, is that good? Mm -hmm. uh, we'll continue the summary. That's right. Um, basically, I think all of us, even those who don't like the budget, think it's a in terms of what it does for the schools, allocating money to the schools, it's, it's well balanced and, and solid and responsible. Um, the problem and where it breaks down is where is sort of how the costs are allocated to the taxpayers. And that's, um, that's more controversial. <laughs> so. <clears throat> Do um, any of Mary Lynn? Um, no. No? Um, not right now. Not right now? Okay. Well, you guys have done a great job, honestly. I can't, I don't know anybody that could have done as good a job at what you've done, you know, in trying to make honey out of this vinegar, but, you know, your hands are tied somewhat. I get that. You know, I don't think. It's still. You know, I, after being in this as long as I've been in it and hearing nothing but equity, 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 and I look at these numbers, there's no way I could ever support this by budget. Nothing to do with you. It's the base ethic of what is behind it. You know, that, you know it's, and that's on our legislators. We'll take that battle to the election box later. You know, and that's the only place we have left to sort that problem out. But we can, uh, you know, still, I mean, I just, in, in, I mean, I know in my conscience, I could not support something like that that hurts, that is so and onerous on the poorest communities. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it's robbing from the poor. Give to the rich, what a likely, you know? It's wrong. And it's just wrong. I, as, a, as a devoted reader of Callis Front Force Forum, you know that you're not alone in that right. sentiment. Although, um, I try to hoping to touch any yeah. people, but. Um, we're hoping that the budget passes. But I get it. I get it. I mean, now, where this, you know, we, this battle wasn't fought early enough to stem this, and now we're in that situation where we only, it only hurts. It hurts the kids if we don't pass it. It hurts the kids if we do. You know, I, I'm one of those, you know, I think about George Washington and Ethan Allen and just about everybody else that actually stood up against Long Island and actually fought and said no. You know, and I've noticed the complete absence in all of these meetings of Janet and Ann Cummings. I read Kim is the only one who showed up and she's the one that supported us. You know, and there, this is really bothersome to me because that's indicative of that. Well, we'll um, we can send them the work on link. <laughs> oh, I'll be talking to them in person. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, Jonas, Jaya, do you have anything that you'd like to add or, or comment? Or? No. No? Have we been through it? We've been through it, all right. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank, thank you for coming up. Yeah, wow. really. And thank you for voting tomorrow. Well, thank you guys for all the work. I don't know how much you've done. In this. Well, so many. really, um, you're thanking us, but, but the person, Lord, the, the woman behind the curtain is the one who made
Who's stressing out the most? One penny is a 160,000 dollar cut. So I'm sitting here stressing out. I know. Well, there's, there's actually, it's so crazy because it's not like, a, you know, if this budget would go down, there isn't a lot of room to cut. And honestly, it's not about cutting a penny. You know, it's about the inequity of distribution of the tax across the towns. That's something we can't, you cannot you know, this is a no-win situation. You, you know, that's the crazy thing in it. And this is the, this is, I, I mean, I can't believe the incompetence of involved with the, in the way this was constructed. And in the face of the data, I mean, and the information that the public, in a resounding voice came out, you heard, you saw it with those hearing rooms. You know, close to a thousand people sometimes, and they were circulating people in and out, and everyone quit telling in. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm just sorry. one question of process. Yeah. This was a meeting tonight. Is, is your quorum five? Um, our quorum is six. But I never called it to order. Um, Lisa is taking, um, is taking notes. Um, so it's not. It's not a formal meeting. Yeah, okay. I, and I guess it doesn't, I figured it doesn't need to be. Yeah, I, I was looking at Robert's rules, and there's this great, great quote. It's actually in Robert's rules for dummies, you know? The court rules <laughs> is uh, quote, as large as can be dependent upon for being present at all meetings when weather is not exceptionally bad. <laughs> <laughs> so I would plead that we have more than s even six at most meetings. This is, this is going to be a lot of work for 10 people. But for only six people, it would be irresponsible yeah, to I, continue in that mode. I think we're, it's just a, um, a function of sort of summer. It's, it's summer, yeah. Well, it's also, it wasn't a meeting meeting anyway. No, it was, it was, it was, so, there was a yeah. information form. Yeah. But what, what's really great and what I very much appreciate, um, again, the, the graduate seminar thing is very informative. And you're putting all kinds of ideas and, um, and and throwing out all kinds of questions that we're going to have to contend with. Well, know the two, you know, you hear me and other people talk, we do, you know, this isn't on you guys, you know, this, somehow we have to come together and you know, the boards, right? and the boards, yeah, and they've done it already, but, and I meant that when I thought it might be worth connecting with other yeah, you know, five boards, and you know, because this is going to unfold itself, and what well, we can learn from each other, and the well, the path yeah, that the yeah. legislature is taking to drive decisions, which are going to fall in your laps. You know, that's the intent of this, I'm sure. And I, you know, part of it is to get the pressure off of the legislators. They need somebody to point to, and unfortunately, you guys, you know, it's these local boards that are, or these merged boards that are going to be the fall guys. In this, and you know, they'll, that's why they are in this room. <laughs> well, we don't. Yeah. They're, we're smarter than that. Yeah. And as a public, we'll, I think. Yeah, we'll we'll sort of um, manage to kind of bumble our way through. Yeah, you will hear one way or another. The pharmacy better than them. Yeah. yeah, we'll run good schools. We'll run them responsibly. We'll take care of the taxpayers' money, and we'll have good outcomes. As far as you can, right? I get that. I, I know that. Are you happy with your school as it is now? Um, parts of it. Not, I'm less with the high school than more with the elementary schools. Mm -hmm. And there's always room for improvement. But you know, I, the farther you get, I mean, your decision, the farther this, the decision makers get from that school, the more blind they become to the problems. And you know, and I, I, I have a lot more trust in community members. Than I do, you know. Their community, uh, community members really deeply care about what's going on. They may not always agree completely, but you put them in a room together, and they will figure it out. And, and always, they'll, you know, make the decision. I think that's what we intend to do. Yeah. As far as you can, the problem is you aren't the ultimate decision makers. You more and more that authority is rapidly being bled up to a place where it's more just a political. Maelstrom, they aren't really looking down at all. Mm -hmm. But we're uh, within our within our scope. I think that's what Janice is saying. Is exactly I get it. You are. You are. Yeah. And I know. It. Thanks for pointing yeah. back. And the fact, you know, Chris and everybody's sitting and written articles, 
to, that would be constructed to best support us, you know, that, that's, that shows that intent. I worry beyond you, too. You know, we've, you know, I, I've watched well, some boards change in time and become more empathetic, and with this completely can unravel if it, now the importance for really good members is paramount. You know, this attention and probably, you know, a lot more pushing back. I mean, we haven't pushed back on this bureaucracy that's run over us. Um, and so this is, these are all, um, these are all very pertinent to what, you know, what we'll be dealing with in the coming weeks and months. So, not just but years, you know, many years, but although I, I hope to have handed off to to uh, some point else by that time. But I, I think um, I don't, we never started, so we're never done. <laughs>